And today I'm going to be talking about are my woods healthy? So assessing the health of your woodland and through that talking a little bit about what is woodland health? What are some of the things that can hurt the health of your trees? And what can you be doing to improve their health? Uh, so uh, my name is Ellen Crocker. I'm a forest health extension specialist and faculty at the University of Kentucky in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And I specialize in forest health. And we're really lucky in Kentucky in that we can grow trees super well. Uh, we've got a fantastic diversity, great environment for growing trees, but we also have numerous threats. So my plan for today is going to be uh, talking about what is woodland health in general, because it's kind of a tricky term and it means a lot of different things to different people. Um, talking about the characteristics of both healthy and unhealthy woodlands. So how do you know what's healthy and what's not? How do you know what your problems are? And then talking specifically about woodland health threats. What are some of the key threats in our area uh, that you might be seeing or you might see in the future? What are some resources for you to build on that into some management for the future if you're interested? And then I want to mention the Healthy Woods app, which is a new app that myself and some colleagues developed um, exactly for you all to walk you through uh, assessing the health of your woods, uh, what's going wrong, what's going well, identifying those things and connecting you to resources to facilitate your management in the future. So uh, I also want to mention before we go forward that um, today I'm going to be talking mostly about woodlands and woodlands come in lots of different shapes and forms. I'm going to use woodland and forest pretty interchangeably. Um, and there are uh, urban forests, of course, and urban woodlands. Uh, most of this is going to apply more in the uh, a natural setting and naturally regenerating hardwood uh, woodland. Um, but uh, some principles will certainly, certainly apply in the urban setting. And then if you're really interested in urban tree health issues, immediately following this webinar at 12, Megan Buland will present another on common uh, problems of landscape trees, which should also be fantastic. Um, so just to kind of set the stage and give some context for that. So what is woodland health? People define it really differently. And I think that's important to emphasize because there's no one size fits all definition. Um, a lot of times, many different uh, definitions of woodland health, uh, one of the act activities I do with my students is to print out a long sheet of different definitions of forest health, uh, which I think surprises them because it shows that there's not one consistent uh, definition for what equals a healthy woodland. And that's because it depends. It depends on where you are. It depends on the type of woodland you have, the trees that are there. Maybe it's age because health is going to look really different if you're talking about something that's all small trees and shrubs, kind of early successional that's just establishing versus if we're talking about mature established trees. Um, it's also going to look really different depending on your goals. So uh, thinking about your objectives and your goals is really important in woodland management. Um, are you trying to maximize for timber production and that's what you really care about? If so, you know, things are going to look a little different than if you really want wildlife and you want to maximize for wildlife um, or maybe you just want to build the most vigorous, um, vibrant, woodland uh, forest that will transition into an old growth forest in the future and be there for your legacy and recreation and uh, enjoyment into the future. Um, so all of those kind of factor in to how do we define woodland health. Um, so two different people might have different definitions, they might have different recommendations, and what really matters is what are your objectives and what do you want. Uh, so that being said, there are some kind of general things that can tell you, okay, you might have a problem here, uh, signs of both healthy and unhealthy woodlands. So what are some characteristics of healthy woodlands? Things like good stand structure in our area, because we have naturally regenerating forests. Um, there are going to be lots of different age groups, different classes, different trees, different species, and you want to have that diversity of stand structure. Um, you want to have great regeneration potential. So that means that these trees are uh, naturally growing. New seedlings are naturally growing. When large trees die, as they do, you know, trees have a life expectancy just like 
humans do, um, when those trees die, there's uh, new trees that can take their place. And it's a sustainable process that doesn't require someone going in and planting. There are seeds in the woods. There's a seed bank that can have that regeneration potential for new trees that you have healthy canopies and trees. This might be the most obvious. And especially if you're thinking about that urban context that's much more managed, um, are your trees healthy? Do they have big full canopies or is there a lot of dieback? Are there clear issues? Um, you know, if there are issues, if you do see big canopy gaps, it's not necessarily a sign of something terrible. Uh, trees die in the woods all the time and that's not an unnatural process. Uh, but if you see a lot of that, to me, that's a major red flag that there's something going wrong. And then vigorous native species. This is native species of trees, of shrubs, of wildflowers, of wildlife, of everything. You've got a really vigorously growing uh, native ecosystem there. And I say few invasives because honestly, it's really hard to find a place that has no invasives, but that they aren't impeding the natural processes that you want to be seeing in your woods. So on the flip side of that, what are some characteristics of unhealthy woodlands? So those are things like, you know, the inverse of everything I just mentioned. Poor stand structure, maybe you have all of your trees kind of being in the same age class and you don't have that diversity. Maybe you have little regeneration potential, so you don't have the seed that you want to see, or maybe the seed that you have and the seedlings that you have aren't the trees that you want to see long term. Uh, lots of dead trees with canopy gaps and die back in their branch tips. That's a sign that those trees are stressed and something's going on. And then abundant invasives. We'll talk more about this, but invasives can refer to the invasive insects and diseases that are directly impacting these trees, as well as the invasive plants that maybe aren't hurting those trees directly, although they might a little bit, but mostly are just changing those systems and changing them in ways that are less supportive of the types of healthy, resilient woodlands that you want to be seeing. Uh, so here's a, here's a little, a little uh, kind of uh, thought experiment. So is this woodland healthy? And I know um, it's hard to tell over photos, but what I'm seeing here is an area that has a lot of trees, um, a dense woodland area, um, and many of them appear to be dead. Now, this could be a trick where this is winter time, and these are simply deciduous leaves and everything else is evergreen, but that's not the case. So what you're seeing here is a stand that was really uh, abundant in ash uh, that those trees were killed with the arrival of the emerald ash borer, which is an invasive insect that kills ash, especially our white and green ash. Um, and this sand, you can see they had a lot of ash. So all of those trees are dead. And you do have some other trees because the emerald ash borer is very specific to ash. It's not gonna impact other species. So fortunately, you've got some trees that are left. It wasn't completely wiping everything out, but you can imagine that in this area, that's a huge impact. Um, so I would say this woodland is definitely not healthy. And we're dealing with the emerald ash borer right now in our state. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I think one of the things to emphasize about that is that if you have a woodland that looks like this, you're in big trouble because that's, you know, 30, 40, 50% ash. Um, that's a huge change and a big disturbance in your woods. Versus let's say you had the state average for ash, which is about 4% of the trees um, in our woods. That's, that's, a, that's a not good and it's you know, terrible to lose a species, to lose that biodiversity because lots of other things are gonna depend on ash. But that's something that our woods can rebound from. Um, our woods and our trees are resilient. And if we just help them in that process, they can do that. We have great diversity. We have lots of other trees that can take their place if you only have two, four, or five percent ash. But if you have a lot of ash, then it becomes a big problem. How about this woodland? What do we think? On the surface, it looks even worse. So you've got a large expanse where all of the trees look dead. Um, and it looks terrible. And if these trees were indeed dead, it would be a major issue. Uh, but this is kind of where 
assessing health can get a little tricky because what's actually happening here is a rare um, occasional outbreak of a native defoliating insect. So this insect, the forest tent caterpillar, will eat leaves and um, most years it's pretty low levels. It'll stay in small numbers. Um, occasional years there will be huge um, outbreaks that will defoliate large areas. That happens once in a long time. It looks terrible. I've been in some of those years and it's eerie. You'll walk around in the woods and there's no trees on the leaves in the early uh, summertime and it sounds like it's raining but it's just the frass of those insects as they eat the leaves. They coat everything and, and make the, the road slick uh, from, from caterpillars. Uh, so it's, you know, very noticeable. But the good news is that this is a native insect and those trees are likely to recover just fine. Um, while the loss of those leaves is certainly a stress to those trees, they are adapted to deal with that occasionally. Uh, one year is not going to be a big deal for them for most of those trees, unless they had something else that was going wrong. Um, if those trees were otherwise growing well, uh, that's something they can deal with, they can recover from in future years. They might put on another flush of leaves after this, photosynthesize for the rest of the summer, and then recover from just fine. So a big difference between kind of uh, two different stands that might both look really bad, one of those being a short-term window that looks bad that the trees will recover, and the other being a fundamental shift in those woodlands. And I'm really concerned about the latter, those things that really change what our woods are and their capacity to recover from other stresses in the future. So another point that I wanted to make is this one right here. So here's a, an area and you can see a snag, a single dead tree. Is that a sign of a woodland health problem? Well, if you had a lot of dead trees, to me, it tells me something. Um, right now, we're seeing a lot of dead trees in areas that were hit by the emerald ash borer. But it's totally normal to have a dead tree here or there in the woods. Not only is it normal because trees age and they die and then other trees take their place. So it's an important part of those systems. It's an important part of those systems in maintaining diversity and it's very essential for wildlife. So let's say you're one of those woodland owners who's trying to maximize for wildlife. You probably are, are okay with having a few more of these snags in your woods than you would be if you wanted to maximize for timber production because those are great places for wildlife. Um, so just a few dead trees. Um, a dead tree here or there does not mean you have a problem. It means that you have a naturally regenerating forest where these processes happen and you can't really avoid that. But what you want is you wanna keep it at a level that's kind of below baseline, that's natural, but you want, don't wanna see things uh, becoming uh, out of control or unusually high mortality there. So there are different health considerations for different stands and different goals, which is one of the things I wanna emphasize today. Uh, but I also wanna mention some of those different types of stands. So we mentioned some different goals, um, but let's talk different areas. So first I'm gonna talk about saw timber. So I'm gonna use some of these terms that may or may not be familiar, um, but saw timber specifically refers to stands that are dominated by large trees, trunks that are over 12 inches in diameter. And those are mixed in with smaller trees as well. So one of the questions that people frequently have is, um, you know, I've got small trees in there too. Does that mean I don't have a saw timber stand? And that's no. Uh, while saw timber typically refers to the use of those woodlands for timber, it also refers to kind of their successional state. So in this type of stand, you've got those big dominant mature trees um, with lots of other age groups and shrubs and uh, wildflowers and other species mixed in. Um, so if we're talking about a stand that looks like that, health and the composition of those dominant trees is key, right? They're the ones that are the dominant trees in that environment. So whether they're doing well or not is very important to the health of your woodland overall. Um, regeneration is also really important. So you've got these big mature trees, but they're not going to last forever. So is what's in the understory, is what's the seedlings that are growing in the forest floor, the seed bank that's there, is that what you want to see for the future? Because those are going to become your future trees. Um, or is there a mismatch there? Is, are you seeing invasives that you don't want in that uh, layer? Are you seeing um, maybe you really want to have a lot of oak species, whether it's for timber or for wildlife or for climate resilience, um, and you're seeing a whole bunch of red maple? Um, is there some mismatch between what you want and what will 
be good for the health of your woods long term and what's happening naturally. And then kind of planning for future harvests and other disturbances because this is the size that people typically harvest and if you know that's in the future for you that's a major disturbance right so you want to set everything up so that post harvest your woods can recover as fast as possible that you're going to get um, your small seeds or your small trees your seedlings growing up into the dominant trees that you want to see and you're not going to get a bunch of invasives taking their place instead. And that applies for harvests, but it also applies for major disturbances. So things like the emerald ash borer. If you know the emerald ash borer is moving in, that's going to take out a lot of your large trees if you have a lot of ash. So prepare for that. Um, then you don't have to play catch up afterwards. Um, go in and, and get rid of those invasive plants that are there so they don't take over and prevent your native species from being able to do what they naturally want to do. Uh, so that's kind of one example with a stand that has these dominant large trees. Let me give you some others because not all woods look like that and that's not a sign that there's a problem. It's just a sign that they're at different stages. So let's talk about this other class called pole timber. That's when you have mostly medium trees with trunks that are between three and 12 inches in diameter. You'll see this a lot um, if a stand is recovering from a major disturbance. So let's say it was harvested, or let's say there is a reforestation uh, where people planted a lot of trees and this is kind of down the road from there. Uh, a lot of those trees are maybe gonna be in the same size class. They're gonna be pole size, that's the, the pole timber name. Um, and they might be really dense. So this is the stage at which they're competing with each other to determine which of those trees is gonna become the dominant trees in that forest going forward. So that's really important because this is the stage at which you wanna determine uh, if, if you've got, or if you're seeing things like trees that won't thrive in that site becoming dominant. You want to eliminate that. You want to support those trees that are going to be a great woodland for you in the future. So which trees are winning <laughs> and are the trees that you want winning? Do they have what they need? So if you've got a lot of invasive species in there that are blocking the trees, the beautiful native trees that you want to see growing into canopy trees, um, this is a key phase to get rid of those and make sure that the trees that you want have access to light and not a whole bunch of tree of heaven or calorie pear species that are non-native to our area don't provide much in the way of wildlife and certainly not timber, um, but also are not going to be the long-lived species that you want in your woods. Um, so this is a key window for what's called timber stand improvement, which would be doing different practices that would promote the trees that you want to see becoming those dominant forest trees um, and discourage those that you don't think are good fits. Uh, so one more example, let's talk about a recently harvested stand. Uh, so this can look radically different depending on how those harvests were done. Um, so tends to be mostly small trees with trunks that are less than three inches in diameter, but this can vary widely because maybe uh, we're talking about a selective harvest or a high grading operation where only um, some of the big trees were taken while others were left. So you might still have some big trees there and you might not have as high access to light. Um, or it could have been something where you have really high access to light and you know pretty much everything was taken. Those can look very different. And I'm using the example of harvest, but this could also apply for a range of different disturbance events that are gonna take out a lot of the dominant trees and leave you with those small trees with, with uh, a, small trunks as well as a lot of shrubby stuff. So this stage tends to be messy. There's a lot of shrubby growth and understory at this point. And I think what's key in this window, if I think about what's healthy, what do we want to see in our woods? Our woods uh, are naturally regenerating. Nobody has to plant seeds to make it happen. Um, at least that's ideally the case. That's what happens in nature. So do you have that regeneration? Do you have the seeds that you want? Do you have the seed bank? Do you have uh, advanced regeneration? So seedlings and small trees that are already there in the understory just waiting for the opportunity, the light window to take off and shoot uh, kind of up. Is that there or is this something you're gonna need to address? Maybe supplement with some planting of things. Um, are there things that are preventing that regeneration? Uh, in many areas, 
invasive plants is the top of my list. If you've got a super dense layer of bush honeysuckle, you're not going to see the regeneration you want. You're not going to see those regenerating seedlings and small trees because they can't get through that dense shaded area. Um, in other areas, deer browse can be a major issue. So if you've got a huge deer population, they can actually browse so much that you don't get those trees growing uh, from seedling into larger tree because they're eating it all. So that's another thing that really depends on where you're located. So another question I have, if this is the type of woods that you had, was what about the large trees that are left? Are they kind of the shining examples of the trees that you hope your woods will be filled with in the future? Or are they trees that maybe uh, they were left because they're not great? They're not great species, either in terms of a good fit for that site, they didn't grow well, um, and that's what's creating the entire seed for your future uh, forest there. Um, are the tree large trees that were left, are they in good condition? Are they really dinged up from machinery or different things if you had a harvest? Um, what's the condition of those large trees and what's their future? It can be great if those trees are a source of seed um, for your woods into the future, uh, but sometimes that's not the case. So thinking about that and what you need to do to match what you want with what you have. So let's talk about a few major woodland health threats. So I gave you some scenarios of what is healthy look like um, and then what are health considerations for different types of stands. But we have in our state some major health threats right now that just across the board are impacting our trees and our woods. Um, this could be true if you're in an urban area, if you're in a rural area, and um, there is some species specificity there, so it might not impact you personally uh, unless you have the species that are impacted, but it's certainly changing our woodlands and our forests. So I put at the top of my list for our area, invasive insects and diseases. We have many and several that are just really uh, killing our trees. Um, the pictures that I've shown here are of emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, invasive insects that are killing ash and hemlock respectively. So a major issue because they're taking out healthy trees, not just those that have some other uh, pre-existing condition, they're stressed. Um, these are taking out healthy trees that are very important in our ecosystems. Invasive plants is another one. And I'll talk more about each of these and, and some examples of them. But why are invasive plants a problem? It's because they are taking the place of native plants that you want to see. They are changing those systems so those native plants can't thrive and they're forming these dense monocultures of the exact same species, of the exact same genetic type, decreasing diversity. Many times our invasives can't really support the insects, the wildlife, um, in the same way that our natives can. Not to say that that birds won't eat their berries and spread them everywhere, uh, but many times it's a different nutritional source that's going to favor different wildlife than our natives would. Um, so invasive plants are a huge issue across the state and they're really challenging to deal with. Uh, the legacy of past management is also something I want to mention. Um, so I mentioned high grading already, the process of just selecting a few high quality trees and leaving the rest. Um, that has happened for many years in our woods. And that kind of over time can degrade the quality of those areas. Um, this stand that I'm showing in this picture here is actually a white pine stand. Uh, white pine wouldn't naturally grow there, um, but it was planted in uh, plantation style in the 70s. And you can see that uh, the intention was for this to be thinned at some point and then harvested, um, not to become a, a natural forest, um, but that didn't happen. And so now you've got um, overly dense, uh, very large white pine that's struggling. And the reason it's struggling is because of those past management practices, the planting of that species there, the, the lack of thinning, um, the downstream uh, kind of management on that. And then Something I want to mention, because we've been seeing more and more of this in our area, but around the country, is extreme weather. Uh, whether that's like this picture is showing here, that drought that we had last fall, that's nothing like we've seen before. This was in the woods when all of those trees should have been green. This time of year, it kind of looks like a fall picture, doesn't it? Um, but this was actually when those leaves should have been green, but they were turning brown 
early fall leaf color because of the extreme drought. Um, in other parts of the country, you're seeing wild fires that are really impacting woods. You know, that's one of the great strengths, I think, of Kentucky and our trees is that we have diversity and we have um, area that can grow trees really well. Uh, but these increased future risks are certainly something that we need to be thinking about in our woodland management. So there are lots of other issues and I'm just gonna focus on a few of them today, a few of those common issues, and then we can talk more if you have any questions. And I don't see any questions yet, so I'm gonna move on. So insects and diseases. I wanna emphasize that invasive species can kill healthy trees and cause big problems. So the emerald ash borer, Hemlock woolly adelgid are the two species that right now are impacting our state the most, um, wiping out ash and hemlock. We have others. We recently uh, have a new invasive species complex, laurel wilt disease, that's killing spicebush and sassafras. Historically, this has been huge. What we're seeing right now is is only a tiny drop compared to the big changes that uh, were caused by the chestnut blight that wiped out American chestnut, which used to be about a quarter of the trees in the Appalachian forests. Can you imagine if emerald ash borer, ash is only 4% of the trees across Kentucky, something that was taking out 25% of the trees in our woods? Um, that's huge, not only from a human use perspective, humans use chestnut both in terms of timber, they ate the nuts, but in terms of our forest ecosystems, how are they dealing with the loss of this keystone species? Um, how is their health right now impacted because chestnut's not there? Uh, I think about that a lot. In addition, Dutch elm disease wiped out elms, which were very important as street trees in urban areas, as well as in woodland settings. Uh, so we're dealing with the echoes of these historic invasive species um, uh, arrivals and uh, killings of many trees, and we always have new ones. The big problem with these is that they're killing healthy trees. It's normal for trees to die, they're not gonna live forever, and especially as trees become older and become stressed, they might be susceptible to a lot of different native issues. These invasives, however, are killing the healthy ones. So native insects and diseases may look bad, but typically are a problem only for stressed trees or they stress trees. So then they can act in concert with other issues. Um, let's say things like the extreme weather or the poor management to create problems, but they're unlikely to be driving issues uh, all by themselves. That's gonna be the invasive species uh, that tend to be more problematic in that way. So here are a couple pictures of, um, you know, things that I hear about every year and get photos of people very concerned about their trees dying. So this is a uh, anthracnose on the left and a yellow poplar weevil on the right. Um, they can look really bad. You can get years where it looks like your tree has lost all of its leaves, but in our woodland settings, those are rarely a problem for the trees because these are native issues that their trees can bounce back from. Uh, in our woodland settings, as long as those trees aren't stressed by something else, these, these are, are negligible and something those trees can deal with. Very different from something uh, like emerald ash borer, which while might not uh, look as bad initially, uh, can kill a healthy tree. So let's talk about emerald ash borer a little bit, um, just in case you aren't familiar with it. Um, here's a photo of the beetle. Um, it's actually only about that big, uh, and it would be pretty. It's a metallic green color, except for that it kills our ash trees. Um, and this is the adult, and what it does is that it lays its eggs on the bark and in crevices in the bark of trees. Those hatch, and the larvae are actually what kills the tree. So they tunnel extensively just under the bark in that vascular system of the tree. The vascular system of the tree is the part that's doing everything. It's moving around nutrients from the roots. It's moving around uh, sugars from the leaves as they go to synthesize and water in the tree. Um, so it's basically like it's strangling the tree. Even though it's not impacting the wood itself, it's just underneath that, that bark layer. Um, it's tunneling is so extensive that it uh, in effect will strangle the tree and kill it that way. So you might never see the adult, you might never see these larvae because they're underneath the bark, um, but what you will see are dead ash trees. Uh, so signs of the emerald ash borer infestation being the dead branches, 
spinning crown, um, D-shaped exit holes now in the serpentine tunneling. Now these are things that are made by the insect, um, the D-shaped exit holes. When the larvae uh, pupate and become adults, they chew their way out of the tree in that D-shape. Uh, so you'll see those as the adults emerge. You might not see very many of them and you might only see them after the damage to the tree has been pretty extensive because by that point the larvae had been living in that tree. Um, and then the same with this tunneling. You might not notice that. Why would you notice that? Um, you can't see under the bark. Uh, but once the tree is dead and dying, like this one here, the bark is flaking off. You can see the, the impact that that larvae had, all of those many different larvae tunneling all through that tree. Um, so right now in our area, we've got a lot of dead trees. So what we see are trees snapping in half, um, bark that's been flaked off as woodpeckers and other wildlife try to get to those larvae. Um, trees that are dropping branches left and right. Those are kind of the symptoms that we would see in our area. But the emerald ash borer is still moving through the state. So this is the most recent map that Kentucky Division of Forestry has put together. Um, they are the ones who uh, deal with reports of new counties for our state. So if someone reports, oh, I have ash trees declining in Muhlenberg County, um, they will send uh, someone to go investigate and see, is that a new emerald ash borer arrival? And if so, add it to the map. Um, so here we are in the central Kentucky area. It's been here for quite some time. So our ash trees are dead and declining for our larger ash trees. Um, we are seeing lots and lots and lots of ash regeneration in the woods, which are ash seedlings that are sprouting up. Uh, unfortunately, those will also be susceptible to the emerald ash borer. So those are not likely to become the future of our forests because they're gonna be killed by the emerald ash borer too. And that's one of those examples where I would say, think really hard about what you want the future of your forest to be. But this is, I wanted to put this out here because I think it's a lot of people um, will think, oh, emerald ash borer has been here for a while. And it has in some areas, but it's a new arrival to much of the state. And if you're bringing firewood, out here to go camping or something like that, you could accidentally move the emerald ash borer faster than it's going to move already. It's only a matter of time before it moves across the entire state. We don't want to move it or any other invasive insect or disease any faster than that's going to happen. The more time we buy ourselves um, in dealing with that, the better. So I see we got a question from Hannah. Let's see, do any other insects exhibit the same type of tunneling under the bark? Or if we see that, does it definitely mean it was emerald ash borer? There are other insects that do that. However, if you have an ash tree and you're seeing that, um, if you're seeing that, chances are that tree is already very uh, advanced in its decline. Um, it's one of the many signs on ash that I would say point to emerald ash borer. Other things to look for would be the D-shaped exit holes, um, decline in the canopy, decline of the tree. And I would also say that if you have an ash tree and you're not treating it with an insecticide and it is a white or a green ash, it will very, very, very likely be killed by the emerald ash borer. They've been looking for trees that have some genetic resistance to the emerald ash borer in other states. Um, and maybe in all of the states, and it, you know, emerald ash borer was first introduced in Michigan in two, 2002, or that's when it was first detected. Um, and in those states kind of to our north and west, they found a handful of trees uh, that have resisted the emerald ash borer that have survived. So I would say that pretty much all of the ash trees, maybe we'll get lucky and there will be a few individuals that have some genetic resistance to the emerald ash borer, and that will be the future of our woods. Um, and I'm working with Kentucky Division of Forestry right now to kind of find those trees and put them in the nursery and hopefully get them back out on the landscape. But the vast majority of ash, if you have an ash and it's got decline symptoms and you live in one of these green counties, you probably have emerald ash borer and your trees will probably die in the near future. Okay, so what most people are asking is, all right, emerald ash borer came in, now I've got dead trees, now what? Um, or maybe my trees have just started to die and what does that mean? So Here's a map of how much ash was in the woods in Kentucky before all of this started. So you can see that it's, it's really patchy across the state. Some parts of the state 
like uh, northern Kentucky, uh, parts of uh, southern Kentucky, especially in riparian areas, um, in western Kentucky as well, had a lot of ash, uh, while other areas have almost none. So how big of an impact is emerald ash borer going to be to you? That depends on how much ash you have in your woods. Uh, and what you need to do about that is also going to be related, because if you didn't have much ash in your woods, that's, that's great. Then you don't have to deal with this too much because you might lose a tree or two, but it's not going to fundamentally change your woods. Um, the other question I would have is how far along is the damage by emerald ash borer? So here's a couple different photos. In this one, you can see some firewood that was for sale with that serpentine tunneling all through it. So that lets me know those trees were killed by the emerald ash borer. And while I don't recommend moving firewood that's been um, uh, killed by the emerald ash borer, uh, when the emerald ash borer kills ash, it leaves the wood intact. So it just kills the, this part of the tree that then will kill the rest of the tree. Um, but that wood is intact for a brief window of time, but then all sorts of other insects and diseases will move in and rapidly uh, impact the structural integrity of that wood. So within you know, just a few months of that tree going downhill, you have ambrosia beetles moving in and they bring with them fungus uh, that will not only decrease the structural integrity of that tree, making them likely to, to fall and fail and drop branches, but decrease the value of that wood. Um, so here's a picture of that. You can see this is some wood that had been harvested from trees that were killed by the emerald ash borer. I'm um, thinking the wood was fine, uh, and it was, except for that it had lots of these tiny little ambrosia beetle holes in it that had moved in after the trees were already stressed and um, really tanked the value of that wood. So if uh, emerald ash borer is not very far along in your area, you've got options. You've got options like treating your trees with insecticides if you want to protect them, because like, you can only do that before the trees are really damaged. Um, you've got options like harvesting your trees in advance of the arrival of emerald ash borer to give you some funds um, to allow you to do some of the timber stand improvement that will set your woods up for success in the long term. Things like removing those invasive species that are in your understory, uh, encouraging the other trees that you want to see becoming, you know, your trees of the future. Um, not to say that uh, trees that are killed by the emerald ash borer can't make great firewood as well, and people do enjoy using those um, for their personal use or uh, selling locally, um, but its value otherwise will nosedive um, as soon as it starts to be impacted by the emerald ash borer. Um, so here's a map of Ash for or ash decline in Kentucky. So earlier I showed you a map of where is the emerald ash borer as well as where is ash. This is a different kind of map and that this was one that was created uh, by actually aerially flying the state and looking for signs of ash decline. So what this tells you is roughly, depending on where you are, and this is from last year, so it's a little bit out of date, but if you're in one of these red areas, ash mortality is very common. So your trees are probably already dead or well on their way to it. So thinking about how you deal with the emerald ash borer is going to look really different than if you're in one of these yellow areas where ash has more recently arrived and you might have more capacity to be on the front end, or in one of these gray areas where ash uh, um, emerald ash borer is isn't there yet, or maybe it was just detected this year. So in those places, you've got a lot of um, capacity to plan for this and to kind of set yourself up for success in the future. So laying the foundation for your woods post emerald ash borer is, is what you wanna do because we can't turn back the clock and we can't stop emerald ash borer in its tracks. Long-term, I think there's some really exciting research happening that will bring back ash and will make it again a part of our woods. But in the short term, you're going to lose your ash. So preparing for that and helping to set up your woods so that it can tolerate that change. It can deal with that and um, not be as negatively impacted as it might otherwise. So you can consider a harvest, offset the costs of any improvement practices you want to do. You can manage invasive species. I can't emphasize this enough. In central Kentucky, what we've seen is that when the canopy is lost uh, from ash dying, uh, what takes off in the understory? Bush honeysuckle. And you're left with thin stands of bush honeysuckle, which is an invasive shrub. Um, which is not something you want to see. You want to see all of your native trees coming up there. You don't want to see invasive bush honeysuckle coming up there instead. So getting rid of that before it becomes a big problem. 
The other thing I'd emphasize is dealing with hazard trees. Uh, so this is uh, of a nature preserve in the Lexington area. And this was uh, a day after they had a major storm. This was last uh, winter. And what you can see is that these are all ash trees that had snapped in that one storm event. Um, so uh, if you had been out during that, it would have been very dangerous. And this is a whole other group of ash that's going to snap in the near future. So ash, when it dies, is it falls apart rapidly. It becomes very brittle and those uh, trees break. It drops branches. On the one hand, that means that probably in a few years, we're not going to have a whole bunch of sandy dead trees. On the other hand, what it means is that these very hazardous conditions in your woods, if you've got a lot of dead ash, especially for the near future, you want to be very cautious of that. And you might need to deal with a professional if you've got a whole bunch of dandy dead ash, because it's dangerous to take that down and it's dangerous to walk around in it. So consider managing your trees before they start falling apart if you're going to spend a lot of time there and you, it's a risk to you or your property. If not, you know, those trees can fall and they'll become great houses for wildlife, um, great banquets for fungi and other things, um, but they are a risk. After they start to fall apart, they're of very low value, um, but those snags do have value for wildlife. But be aware of them, especially when it's windy, and call a professional, a forester, to help you deal with them. So another invasive that I want to move on to is hemlock woolly adelgid. I'm just going to touch on this briefly uh, because it has a more localized scope. It impacts uh, hemlock, which is really a problem in a lot of the um, very important ecologically uh, river and creek riparian areas in the eastern part of our state. So here are some trees that have been killed by the hemlock woolly adelgid. And here you can see how that would look in the summertime. It doesn't always look like this. So this is only going to be kind of a, a, an ephemeral uh, way of seeing the hemlock woolly adelgid. And the rest of the year, it's not going to be as apparent. Um, but it will kill trees the way it's killing trees is those adelgids, the insects, are sucking the sap out of the, the tree. And when they're doing that, they also inject a toxin that not only are they draining the tree of resources, but that toxin will dry up the needles and uh, cause dieback of those tips. Um, and it's not something that's going to kill a tree in one year or two years or three years, but over the time, over several years, it certainly can. And the big problem with hemlock woolly adelgid is that those hemlocks grow in really sensitive areas, um, areas where there's amphibians there and those uh, creeks and streams. Uh, there are invertebrates there that really impact water quality, everything that happens downstream of those areas. So losing those trees uh, is a big issue. So here's where the hemlock woolly adelgid is right now. Uh, all the, the red or maroon colored uh, counties are where it's been detected. This was in 2018. So again, it might be a little out of date. Um, you can see there's still some green areas where it hasn't been detected in Kentucky. This is Mammoth Cave, as well as some counties in Northeast Kentucky. But really, I'd say that that spread through our range. If it's not there yet, it's very likely that it could get there, um, but it's very patchy in distribution. So it's not kind of like the emerald ash borer where it just came through in a wave. The hemlock woolly adelgid is pretty patchy. You might get areas where there's mortality and areas where there's not, um, but it's something to be aware of because even though you haven't had it yet or even though it hasn't been a problem yet, it certainly could be in the future. So uh, in some areas, that mortality is really high. There are some insecticide treatment options uh, for that, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, in addition, there's trials being done with different biological controls. So predatory beetles that would actually eat those adulgids, and hopefully long-term, the management strategy can shift away from uh, the dependence on the insecticide and have more of a uh, sustainable you know, something that's going to naturally happen through these predatory uh, insects and as well as genetic resistance in the tree. But this is something to be aware of because it's going to continue to be a problem. Now, I just want to mention invasive plants because we don't have a lot of time left and there's so many different invasive plants that we could discuss. Um, but what are invasive plants? They're non-native species. They are a big problem, so they cause problem economically, ecologically, uh, they, they have a negative impact, and they can take over. So this is a couple examples of some invasive plants that I've worked with before. Uh, lesser celandine, these 
big buttercups right here, spring ephemeral, um, and purple loosestrife, which you'll see more in your wetter areas. There's some in western Kentucky. Um, but I think they illustrate something that uh, is important in that this is the federal definition of invasive plants. They're non-native and they cause economic or ecological harm. Uh, invasive plants can be pretty, but that doesn't mean they're not invasive and that they can't take over and be a real problem. Similarly, native does not necessarily mean desirable. I get this question a lot, you know, um, is this an invasive, this uh, poison ivy? I'm sure you recognize it. Or maybe this grapevine. Um, you can dislike poison ivy and grapevine for a number of reasons, and I will not argue with you there, but neither one is invasive. Uh, they are native species. They're unlikely, while they can cause problems, um, poison ivy for you personally, if you get it on you, and grapevine by impacting the growth of your trees, especially if you're in a younger uh, stand, um, by growing over them and taking over. Uh, they're not going to do what our invasives do in terms of creating these dense, dense monocultures of the exact same thing. Uh, so native also does not mean, though, that they won't take over. A couple examples of that right here. I've got river cane and sumac. So you wouldn't, these are natives. They're great natives. I love them both. And I would not plant river cane in my backyard because it will take over. Um, it's nowhere near as bad as invasive bamboo, which I discourage anyone from planting. But it is a native that has its place and its place is somewhere where it can spread, uh, not in an area that needs to be really restricted and localized. So just some terminology there. So why are invasive plants a problem? They get in the way of your goals. They reduce regeneration. They decrease biodiversity. They change ecosystems. They take advantage of disturbances, which we are seeing right now with the emerald ash borer for sure. But this also applies if you're planting a harvest. If you're planting a harvest, what you want to see is regeneration of native species. You don't want to see a dense field of some invasive. Um, and this is another photo I included because vinca is, is commonly used in um, ornamental settings and landscape settings. And that's where a lot of these invasives get their start. Um, others were introduced because someone had the bright idea of bringing them in and they'd control erosion or something like that. And years later, we discovered that they could do that. They grew really well, but they also took over. Um, so sadly, we're getting more and more invasive plants. Um, they arrive, uh, whether accidentally or intentionally, in the ornamental uh, industry. Um, and it's really hard to know ahead of time what's going to become an invasive. Um, but now that we know, and there are many that we know become invasive, I'd encourage you not to plant them. Plant native alternatives instead, and then try to eradicate them from your woods. So there are many characteristics of invasive plants, whether you're talking about high reproduction, fast dispersal, fast growing, tolerant of a range of habitat, or a few natural predators to change the environment to their benefit. Basically, these invasive plants thrive. They thrive, they establish rapidly, they reproduce prolifically, and those all let them take over and dominate, whereas their native competitors might be less successful. So they come in all different shapes, sizes, and forms. I'm just going to run through a few of those. You have invasive trees that are problems because they directly compete with the native species you want to see, right? Tree of heaven, princess tree, or polonia, mimosa. I'm seeing a lot more of that lately. And I see people plant it in their yards, and I want to say, no, mimosa is not a good yard tree. It's messy, and it's not long-lived, but it will also take over. And the same with Bradford or calory pear. I strongly discourage people from planting that. You'll regret it in terms of a tree that's not a good tree for you, but also it will take over. You have invasive shrubs like multifloral rose, autumn olive, bush honeysuckle, privet, and those will form those dense stands in your understory, prevent other species from establishing. You've got vines like kudzu, winter creeper, Japanese honeysuckle, and you've got grasses and herbaceous species like miscanthus or Chinese silvergrass, uh, Japanese stiltgrass or microstegium, and there are always new invasive plants to be on the lookout. These are a couple that I put in, uh, especially from the northern Kentucky or central Kentucky area, Japanese chaff flower, which really takes over in those riparian areas that can then move into your woods, and then lesser celandine, which is a spring ephemeral, a buttercup that comes and is gone, but it takes up area that could be your native wildflowers and other things that you want to see, not this invasive. So 
are invasive plants a, wood, a problem in your woods? I'd say get to know the most common invasives in your area. That'll, that'll tell you whether or not you can go scout your woods and see, do you have those? Do you have other things that are really dominant that are kind of taking over? What are your goals? And how are invasive plants getting in the way of those? Uh, you know, maybe you have a ton of bush honeysuckle in your woodland, and maybe you've got a lot of big dominant trees. It might be a problem for a number of reasons. Um, you know, taking the place of the native shrubs and wildflowers that you want to see from a wildlife perspective, but it's not going to really hurt those tall trees. It might a little bit, but it's not going to fundamentally change those. Versus, let's say you've got a, a early, uh, early successional stage woodland. You've got a recently harvested area or an area that's just growing up from a re reforestation event. Uh, then your bush honeysuckle can be a huge issue. And so you need to think about that. What are those invasives doing? What are they getting in the way of? And how can you stop that? Because you might not be able to get rid of them forever but you can certainly help your woods. You can make a big impact. And I'd encourage you to say, just because they're not invasive in your garden doesn't mean they can't still be invasive in natural areas. So think about these invasives when you're doing your landscaping, when you're purchasing plants, uh, encourage people to, to value those native species that not only really look great and thrive in our gardens, but also support the insects and the wildlife that, that need them. So what can you do about invasive plants? Prevent their arrivals, number one. If you can do that, then you're doing well because you've set yourself up for success in the future. It's way easier to prevent them from getting there or maybe if they have gotten there, uh, get them before they've spread too much. Because if you can remove a bush here, a bush there, maybe I see a comment about stilt grass, a little bit of stilt grass before it spreads everywhere, you're in luck. Once you've got a ton of stilt grass, Wow, that's tough. Um, then we're talking about containing and mitigating and hopefully eventually removing it locally. We're never going to get rid of it across the state though, so it's going to continue to come back. Um, and there's a lot that you can do with these different invasives. And instead of giving uh, particular advice on management of individual invasive plants right now, because there are lots of different options and it's always case dependent, I'm gonna steer you to some resources. So here are some useful resources that I highly recommend. They're all free and they're from the Forest Service. Um, there's different books on management of invasive plants in Southern forests. How to identify invasive plants in, in our forests. And then what are the natives that you might confuse them with and how do you distinguish that? And I put them all in a Dropbox folder or a Google Drive folder that you can access. Um, here's the link, or you can just take a photo of that QR code and it'll take you right to that uh, box if you're interested in that. Or you can just Google a management guide for invasive plants in Southern forests and you'll find these resources for free. So there's also great expertise to help you in invasive plant councils and non-native uh, or native plant societies. Lots of uh, really passionate, really knowledgeable folks who can get you started in the right direction. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up and just encourage you, if you've got Woodland Health questions, uh, number one, reach out to your county extension agent. They are phenomenal resources and every single county in the state of Kentucky has extension agents who can help you with your questions and connect you to resources. Um, there's extension specialists like myself, uh, Billy Thomas, who specializes in woodland uh, owners, Jonathan Larson, who specializes in entomology, um, who can also assist if you've got really focused issues, and particularly working with you and your county agent if needed on a tricky problem. There's also the Kentucky Division of Forestry. Not only do they have service foresters who will come out, walk your woods with you, and whatever it is you want to do, whatever your goals are, uh, get you geared up for success. They have a forest health specialist, Alexander Blevins, who goes out and if you think you have emerald ash borer in a new county that's not been detected before, she'll go out and look at your trees with you and try to determine what's going on there. Um, I also want to recommend consulting foresters who are paid professionals that you can hire to come with you to your woods and make a plan for you that's going to meet all of your objectives and goals, whatever those are, um, as well as technical service providers. Maybe you've got a lot of uh, bush honeysuckle in your woods and you know you can't get it out, but you could hire somebody that would work to remove that bush honeysuckle. 
And then I just want to mention, if you're not already familiar with the cost share funding opportunities that are available through NRCS, um, talk with your, your uh, county agent or talk with your local NRCS office about that to see if that might be something that you qualify for. And then before I leave, I just want to mention the Healthy Woods app. If you're interested in all of this and want to learn more about the health issues in your woodland, you want to identify problems and connect to professionals for next steps in your management, check it out. Um, I'm going to send you to the web page for that. Uh, let's see, right here, healthywoodsapp.org. Um, and you can assess the health of your woods. You can uh, kind of share your reports with professionals for next steps in your management. And you can keep track of those for your own use, for your own records going forward in the future. So uh, with that, I just want to see if anyone has any other questions. And I see we've got uh, someone has their hand raised. If you have a question, feel free to chat it in the chat box or in the question section. And um, with that question on Stiltgrass, Stiltgrass is tricky. And if you want to email me, we could try to um, brainstorm some solutions. I definitely recommend checking out some of those resources I mentioned and seeing if any of those kind of fit what you're talking about. And if not, uh, we can work together on something, a plan of action. Um, any other questions?